Thanks, Emma, and thanks, uh, Jenny and Closer, for inviting me along to talk about growing up in Scotland today. So, um, yeah, some of what I'm going to say mirrors a little bit uh, what Michaela has uh, mentioned and talked about in relation to Understand Society, because although the Understand Society is a household longitudinal study and Gus is a cohort study. Uh, they're both uh, very multi-purpose and quite multidisciplinary in nature and in, uh, in the respect that neither study um, has a specific biomedical focus, but certainly collects lots of data of interest to people doing biomedical research. But first of all, what is uh, growing up in Scotland or Gus as we call it? Well, it's a large scale longitudinal birth and child cohort study. And we've actually had multiple cohorts involved in this study to date. We started off in 2005 with um, birth cohort one and the child cohort. So our first birth cohort were aged around 10 months old uh, at the time of the first data collection. All children living in Scotland at that time, not necessarily born in Scotland and with just over 5,000 of them at the point of launch. And we also had the child cohort, slightly older children, uh, it's just under three at the time of the first interview, recruited at that time as well, a slightly smaller group, just under 3,000. And then we recruited a second birth cohort that we called, you know, birth cohort two. We were struggling to come up with anything um, uh, more exciting there. Uh, a, a slightly larger group, but comparable to the first birth cohort, also recruited around the time they were 10 months old uh, and children all living in Scotland at that time. And we've collected data on all of those cohorts since that time, or, although uh, not the same amount of data in each cohort as I'll come on to in a minute. So growing up in Scotland is uh, commissioned by the Scottish government. So it's very much a study that is informed by um, the needs of policy uh, and evidence requirements for policy. And it's got quite a broad remit. Uh, and I've put on this next slide some of the sort of primary objectives that, that, that drive the content and, and design of growing up in Scotland. So yeah, we're very much interested in looking at change and stability in children's lives, looking at the impact of change on their outcomes, looking at differences in outcomes for children of different backgrounds and identifying risk and protective factors um, and highlighting in particular those risk and protective factors that are most amenable to local and national policy influence. And being a, a Scottish study and a study that is, is commissioned by Scottish government, there is an interest on and focusing on substantive areas where good Scottish evidence is otherwise limited um, and, and areas of focus for Scottish policy and service delivery. But actually, um, the, the content of the data that we collect is very similar to that which is collected on, on comparable UK and international cohort studies. Uh, but the study is about providing evidence to support the development of effective and responsive policies for children and families. And these are probably the broad domains which our data falls under uh, uh, and has done over the course of the, you know, the 17 or so years that we've been running the project. And I'm going to say a little bit more about the data content in relation to some of these as we go forward. So we've been running since 2005. Um, and this slide gives you an overview of the pattern of data collection for each of the cohorts since that time. So, and what you'll see is what I referenced earlier is that we've had different patterns of data collection for the different cohorts in that there is significantly less data available for the child cohort and birth cohort two than there has been for birth cohort one, which is very much continues uh, to be the only focus of the study at the moment and going forward. So we had a very intensive period of annual data collection for these children and their families between um, the ages of 10 months and age six, so around the time they started school. And we've collected data about every two years from them since then. Uh, we're currently in field with our age 17 field work. So that's sort of corresponding to their last year in secondary school. Some of them, of course, have left school already. Um, and then staying with that cohort, just looking at what our numbers look like over that time. So we started in suite one with uh, just over 5,000 children. At the most recent completed sweep, uh, suite 10, 
we still had uh, about 2,700 actively participating and, and given data at that sweep from that main sample. We actually added a boost to the cohort, the, the birth cohort one sample at sweep nine. Now that corresponded with the point that children were starting secondary school. So an extra 500 um, children and families were added to the sample at that point. And we targeted um, uh, families with characteristics uh, of those who were most likely to drop out uh, up to that point. So primarily um, families from disadvantaged uh, areas, uh, uh, children who were born to younger mothers um, and, and characteristics like that to try and uh, address some of the bias that was uh, occurring through uh, attrition to that point. So what we've got um, uh, at Sweet 10 is about half of the original main sample participated. We've got another couple of hundred that we continue to actively maintain in the cohort. And in fact, those sweet 10 numbers affected by the fact that, you know, about three quarters of the way through our face-to-face -face field work, we of course had COVID and lockdown and we had to switch to remote data collection using web and telephone. And the response rate for that remaining sample was lower. Uh, otherwise we would have ended up um, with a few more than that. Uh, so that's how the numbers look over time. The next slide summarizes this, the different sources of data collection that we gathered on those participating children and their families over time. So very much our key source of data collection over the years has been a face-to-face -face interview with the child's main carer. And that has tended to be the child's biological mother, though it's not exclusively so. Um, that has tended to be who has uh, provided that information. That's normally been about a 60 minute interview. Uh, we supplemented that with some uh, interview data with the main carer's partner and some questionnaires from uh, the child's teacher around the time they were reaching the end of primary school. And of course, the children themselves have completed questionnaires or undertaken interviews with us since they were age eight. So we've got a whole host of survey interview data, and that's very much uh, the, the, the majority of, of our data that's available. Uh, alongside that, we've got some objective data that's collected as part of those interviews. So uh, child height and weight measurements fairly routinely from around the time they were age two or just about age three. Uh, and we've tried to do that every uh, sweep of data collection since then. And we've also asked the children to complete uh, cognitive assessments, primarily measuring uh, the vocabulary development over time since age three, uh, and we're, we're continuing to do that at age 17. So we've got these sets of objective data collected as part of the interview too. Then we have a host of linked administrative data similar to uh, Understand Society, of course. We have permission to uh, link to health records for the children and to some extent for the, the their mothers too. Um, we have access to their school records, um, going started from preschool, so some information about the preschool centres that they attended, as well as uh, information from throughout primary school and secondary school. And at the moment, um, uh, as part of the age 17 sweep, we're gathering the permission uh, to link to the attainment data, so that's the exams from the Scottish Qualifications uh, Authority, so that will give us their sort of uh, GCSE and A-level equivalents uh, information, but also some post-school destination information, which is collected by Skills Development Scotland. So that will tell us about that transition uh, and uh, the, the extent to which they've reached positive destinations when they've left school. Uh, so we're negotiating that access just now, and we expect that hopefully to be available towards the end of next year, alongside the Sweep 11 data. Um, it is very much a multi-purpose, uh, multidisciplinary study. So we do gather data on a wide range of topics. And, uh, you know, as Michaela hinted, uh, actually there are a small amount of questions on each topic to some extent to get that breadth um, rather than depth. Uh, although there are some topics that we repeat at every sweep um, and probably have a little more detail than others. But what I've tried to do is drill down into those topics that, that are perhaps of greater interest 
to those people who are working in the biomedical sphere and maybe more interested in doing analysis, looking at biomedical issues. So this first slide, um, focusing initially on data provided by the cohort children themselves from age eight onwards. And what you can see is that we have got some repeat measures from age eight, particularly on life satisfaction, and then starting to pick up measures of body satisfaction, perception of weight that we use alongside those objective measures of height and weight. And as they enter uh, kind of adolescence at ages 12 and 13, um, uh, more comprehensive measures covering health behaviours, mental health and well-being, um, um, moving on at older ages to uh, measures of puberty. Uh, I've not added it in there, but also sexual activity, pregnancies uh, and so on when they reach older age points. And these all as reported by the, the children, the young people or cohort members themselves. But of course, we've also gathered a wide range of data from parents about their children uh, and of course, uh, uh, and continue to do that alongside uh, collecting data from the children themselves. So this covering similar areas to the, the data that we get from kids themselves um, uh, on uh, communication and language, social emotional behavioural development, to some extent perception of weight and so on, diet, but picking up issues of dental health, um, uh, access to or in contact with health services, sleep going back to younger ages, uh, measures of physical and sedentary activity, self-report measures of that too. Uh, and then of course we have uh, data reported by the parents about themselves. Um, and these data cover issues like general health, long-standing illness, disability, uh, the parents' physical and mental health and well-being, um, their own perceptions of their own weight, uh, data about the pregnancy and birth, uh, their own physical and sedentary activity, and some of their own uh, uh, health behaviours, uh, smoking, alcohol and drugs. Uh, and these are typically um, and very often um, repeat measures, so certainly uh, uh, measures of general health, long-standing illness, measures of the physical and mental health and well-being we've got at repeat points over time uh, using the same measures consistently. Uh, and we've also got some of these measures or many of them both from the main carer who's uh, their main respondent and uh, the main carer's partner uh, at multiple sweeps. Um, I've put adverse childhood experiences in there because that is something that we've included in the, the current questionnaire. I'm going to say current. I'm now wondering, is it actually sweep 10, which is what I tend to do when I'm talking to people about the study. Can't quite remember exactly when we've collected it. But we have used a um, uh, uh, widely recognised uh, questionnaire measuring adverse childhood experience, which is a big uh, policy interest to Scottish Government in particular. Of course, it's of interest to researchers and policymakers elsewhere. Uh, and that's been collected uh, by the parent. Um, there has been some analysis undertaken of GUS data, which has attempted to recreate these measures for the children themselves based on data that we've uh, that we've gathered. And there's some references on our publications page on the website if you're interested in looking at that as well. So that's our survey data. Um, a little bit more about some of the objective data we've got. So height and weight, um, uh, perhaps one of the key um, biomedical measures that we've got measured in home um, by trained survey interviews using scales and stadiometers. So that's self-report data. Um, the interviewers are all accredited uh, as part of their training process and, and multiple measures for the children um, uh, from age four onwards. Uh, and we're trying to do that at age 17. We've got some missing data at age 14, sweet 10, because we weren't able to go in home uh, because of COVID. Uh, and certainly at the start of the age 17 data collection, that was also the case. Uh, so some uh, slightly uh, less data at those sweeps for some uh, parts of the cohort. Uh, the child's mother was also measured when the child was age six. That's the only point we've got uh, a, a parent measure or BMI. And we use these health and weight, um, height and weight measurements to pre-calculate BMI. 
um, and that's included in the data set. And there's a range of BMI uh, variables included because there are multiple different ways that you can uh, calculate it using different uh, cutoffs. Uh, they're all included with documentation provided. Uh, and of course, they're all height and weight is there also. Um, lots of publications have utilised these data already. So if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about how these are been used, you can just have a little uh, browse of our publications page. Um, uh, some objective data that we do have that I haven't um, mentioned already is on physical activity. Now, this was collected uh, uh, with our, by our collaborators as part of the Sweep 8, the age 10 data collection. Um, our collaborators at the MRC CSO, Social and Public Health Sciences Unit at University of Glasgow as part of their spaces study and this was where a subset of the sample were asked to wear waste worn activity monitors and gps devices for eight days during waking hours and we got data on around 800 participants at, at age 10 with at least five days of valid data and we're repeating that exercise with the full cohort at age 17 um, and that will produce some longitudinal data for those who've taken part before and some new data uh, for those who didn't take part before. Uh, this data isn't quite available yet. We're just agreeing the measures at the moment and we're looking to deposit that in the next few weeks. But there'll be a range of derived measures available um, uh, allowing you to explore time spent in sedentary light, moderate to vigorous activity and so on. Uh, and we're aiming to put that into the UK data service alongside the other data. And then, of course, a little bit more detail on the linked health data. So what we did with our health data is when we set up the linkage, we agreed um, what we called a minimum data set. So we uh, looked at the, the, the key health administrative data sets that were available um, and had data about children and mothers around the time we were linking, which was around the time birth cohort one were age six. And we extracted a small number of variables from each of these data sets to put them together in this pre-organized minimum data set that you could then apply to and access. Um, and this gives an example of some of the data that's included in that. So um, the SMR data sets, uh, 00 and 01 are outpatient, inpatient admissions, O2 is um, pregnancy and birth. Uh, we've got the Scottish Immunisation uh, Recall Service that has data on uh, various uh, immunisations uh, given to the child. Uh, then, of course, the Child Health Surveillance Programme, which measures data collected via health visitor and midwife visits uh, um, up to school age. Uh, a and &E attendance and a, and a range of dental data. Now, there are a whole range of other um, health administrative data sets out there, and the cohort is linkable to those. Uh, the point here is that it's already, there's already a set of agreed variables for this one, and so actually it's a little bit more straightforward to access um, than, uh, than it would be to link to a new admin database. Uh, but the, the, the basis is there to do that. Um, we've got that linkage set up. Um, the Yeah, the linked health data. I'm not going to go into detail about the linked education data, uh, but certainly happy to provide more info on that if you want to get in touch with me afterwards. But of course, aside from all of these data, which are uh, focused on health of the children, or of their parents, their health outcomes. We have got a very rich set of background variables and explanatory factors um, available in, in, in the uh, associated survey data and linked data. And that includes everything from a whole range of socioeconomic characteristics on income, occupational classification, educational qualifications, housing tenure, and so on. Um, area measures such as area deprivation, urban rural classification, which can be linked in and uh, lots of other things around um, parenting, neighbourhood, community, uh, relationships, family, technology, uh, and so on. Um, uh, all of the survey data and some uh, additional geography variables and administrative data is available via the UK data service. Uh, uh, it, it's at a minimum available as special license, which means there is an application process which needs to be approved at the moment. Um, some of the geography variables uh, 
uh, are under secure license, uh, which means you need to access them via the secure lab, as is the care inspectorate. This is the preschool quality uh, linked data, which you can get via UKDS as well. The health link data is held uh, on the NSS National Safe Haven. Uh, so applications to that are coordinated by the Electronic Data Research and Innovation Service, and they're reviewed by the Health and Social Care Public Benefit and Privacy Panel, or PBAP, as we call it for short. Um, uh, so there's a separate application process for that. Um, there is more information about that, either via the EDGES website, but if you want more insight into applying for the uh, link data, you can also get in touch with us at the study email address there too. And uh, all of this information is available via a dedicated uh, page on our website. Um, in terms of case studies, uh, I just wanted to pick first, uh, two, and I'll just mention them quickly. Um, uh, both recently published. So this one uh, we did uh, with some uh, researchers and uh, predominantly at Edinburgh University led by them as part of the UNICEF Data for Children Collaborative. And the idea was to use GUS data to explore the extent to which universal routine health screening um, uh, data on children up to age six could be used to predict uh, obesity at age 12, with the idea that if it could, would introducing universal health, health screening, particularly in low to mid income countries, um, give them a fairly cost efficient way of targeting children who are likely to become obese and um, focusing resources to, to tackle that. And the analysis used uh, equivalent data collected on GUS to predict uh, obesity at age 12 uh, and actually found it was possible. Around two thirds of children screened at risk uh, were found to be obese at age 12. Uh, but of course, it meant one third were identified as at risk who didn't turn out to be obese at age 12, which um, is a potentially a large referral burden. Um, another example using the physical activity uh, the accelerometry data collected at age 10. And there's quite a few articles available which use this and also combine it with the GPS data, which was collected as part of this study. This one, um, quite a simple uh, analysis comparing differences in levels of uh, physical activity between children living in urban and rural areas of Scotland, um, finding uh, quite interestingly, although perhaps not surprisingly, children living in rural areas with slightly higher levels of light uh, physical activity and lower levels of sedentary activity um, relative to those living in urban areas, but lots of um, other publications um, using these data and other um, similar biomedical research available from our website. And if you want to find out more, um, those are some of the details. Thanks very much. <laughs>